see uh, you can see my screen right okay, so for this week one case of rearranging your everything we also see what you can do on your github repository as well basically this would be instruction what you should include in something you have report that you could use as a reference to improve your repo structure so let's go through the slide so we start from naming convention so uh, for in regarding to repo uh, use descriptive ending name for your report study. For someone who's checking out your report study, it should be readable for them. So avoid using generic names like project, report study, don't do that. Just make it uh, related to your project uh, concept, your naming. Use lowercase, separate words with Ivan. These are just best practices. Be concise and just make them easy to remember your naming. You should give it a thought how you name your module, your folder, everything. And when it comes to branches, when you are working in a team in the future, maybe uh, how you name your branch also is something you should consider. So there is a main branch which is clear; everyone understands what it does. Of course, you are when you are in the development part with other teams, the the, the develop name indicates that the development branch. Uh, the features where you include these new features that you add on your project, especially when you are in a team, if someone is using the user authentication, for example, giving like the, this kind of naming for those single features on a branch is also important. It makes it more descriptive and manages it to work in a collaborative environment. So make sure you you give also a thought in naming branches when you work on a team. As for directory namings in your for repository, usually, for example, in React uh, front end framework application, you see this SRC naming. Usually, everyone who is in the development uh, area knows the SRC is some uh, folder name that where the main code exists. It depends, of course, on the framework, but there are these common names for where the main application code exists, like app. SRC. So uh, try to follow those so everyone who reads uh, uh, your code can understand easily where your main code is. Uh, tests is the, the common name for if you have a testing for your application, it usually should be put on the test folder naming. The docs, if you have documentation for your application, uh, scripts, these utility scripts that you uh, create for your application, you are put on the script. And config, these are just general uh, common understanding between developers, between anyone who reads other people code. They easily understand your code if you give them these general common names for your directory repositories. As for files, use again your case letters. Uh, again, it depends also on the framework that you use. For example, on React, some people might say, uh, having a Camille case later meaning is more common, which is starting this capital letter in the other also other book. It's another separate word. Meaning it depends, follow the base plot for that framework as well. There's also an understanding based on the framework, but usually as a rule, you can take lower cases with separate uh, with hyphen or underscore avoid spaces special characters in file names yeah don't do that um, be consistent on your extension giving for your particular module uh, as for commit on your repository you need to be clear concise just don't give some random uh, name that you only understand for that commit history when you work in collaborative environment your commit history is really important your commit naming is really important someone will understand your new commit uh, has to know what is about by just seeing your commit message, your name, the name that you get there. So uh, make sure to be concise and descriptive on your commit history. It's really important. Uh, for if you have issues, ticket numbers that are uh, people are giving issues, or if you are giving issues on someone GitHub repository, usually if you've seen uh, open source coders or some 
uh, reposted where a lot of issues exist. I usually give this number for the issue. So this is issue number 42. You are the 42% to come to give an issue on the FIFO study. Uh, they have this kind of structure just to give a better understanding with each other around the world. So you have to be really uh, sensitive on these descriptions that you give on community history. So it's really important in a collaborative environment. Uh, it's, it can it will come handy. So you make sure to give that as well. Uh, what are the components you should include? If you don't have on the repos that you have right now, you should include a readme. Your readme should be comprehensive. It should provide the overview of the project, the purpose, the features. There are these amazing features of the project that you want the reader of your readme to, uh, to attract. Make sure to put those features. Installation instructions, examples, uh, it depends on the project type and what you want to uh, pass, what kind of information you want to pass. But the purpose of Readme is to grab someone's attention of your project. Someone should at least have some hint of what your project is uh, and how to install it using it by reading your Readme. So you need to be really careful when you vote your Readme. Uh, it should be well organized. Uh, it should have clear sections and formatting. It should be easy to read. Uh, this is the same thing, like I said before. It could be the SRC or the app directory, or could be another name. But usually, this naming indicates someone that their main code of the application exists in that. Uh, so you should uh, give a good name for your main application code. If you make it a name that is more commonly understood by everyone, uh, the better. Uh, the test directory, again, you should include tests for your application, whether it's a front end or a back end, and ensure that it should be uh, specified on the test naming directory. So if, if the name is test, everyone understand you're testing it to that particular folder, and it will be easy, easy to access. The docs, right now in the state that you guys are, you might not worry about this one. You don't have particular professional documentation or REST API guidance for your application. But if you have, which also is recommended, it, it will be, make a lot of other readers of your mind easier to understand your workflow uh, if they have some kind of guide. And this is where the docs folder is for that purpose. Practically, it's, an, it's a guide line for your REST APIs and everything. Uh, the build this directory, uh, it shows for any compiled, if you have compiled or package artifacts, uh, artifacts such as binary any development package, uh, when you run the RAM build, this is a particular folder, it will be automatically generated actually. Uh, so it's just it's for the DevOps part, when you deploy it in the production and you RAM build it, uh, the dist or the build director will be created. Uh, for the git ignore, you are also familiar with this one. It's, it's this file particular purposes to exclude all the folders file that you don't want to be pushed on the remote repository. Uh, so this is also one best practice to include on your repository. The license is just to indicate your um, particular license or uh, ownership on that project could be MIT or Apache or anything. This, you don't have to worry about this now, but it's also a best practice to include, just to see, to show, uh, to give clear information how the project can be used, if it should be modified by others or not. This license file uh, can give ideas for others. So if you allow them or not, it will define that. This contributing MD file is also another file that you can create like the readme, which uh, outlines guidelines and processes of, for contributing to the project, including how to report issues, submit issues. So if you choose to do that for anyone who is going to be committing or um, giving issue, uh, submit rec uh, feature requests. Uh, if you go to a person's projects, you can see this file. It is just like a guideline that they will uh, 
later or other who will probably give issues, comment on their project, or even push something new features or whatever, request new feature or on the application, they would should uh, you will write a guideline how they should do that. So they can follow your particular instruction when they do that. So this helps to create a consistency and welcoming contribution process for the project overall. And there is the CICD configuration, which uh, I think would, uh, it's an important thing to include on your report study. It gives you the continuous integration and continuous deployment. It will automatically aut automate the build of your application, the testing, the deployment process from beginning to end. So it's really an important procedure to include on your GitHub repo study. And there are these MIGFI Docker, which you should, these tools that helps you to build automation scripts to run to, these are part of the DevOps uh, section, which helps to provide automation and scripting. Uh, they just simplify the building process and ensure consistency across the different environments. Uh, so you should include these tools that make for the Docker. Uh, good um, Git readme includes title and description. Uh, it's about the project, the description about the project. If the readme is big, it could be hard to track uh, for a reader. So giving them like a table of contact to just guide them uh, which each, what each section includes like an outline, uh, it will help. So if you read me, if you decide to make it longer, having a table of uh, content is advisable mm -hmm. in installation step by step instruction, how they can install the dependence, everything is something you should include usage detailed instruction, how to use a project, including example or sample code. If you prefer that, you can include that. It will, the more descriptive is your readme, the better for the reader. So uh, it's also to, uh, if, you are, if you want to do that, you should include the usage as well. Features, if there's any key features or capability of the, the project that really can attract a reader for anyone on employer in your case, you should include in your readme these features. By I mean, maybe sharing a screenshot just to show how uh, interesting the project is, some key features that you implement. You should include that on your readme on some creative way. A screenshot and demos, at least if you have one screenshot, like a feature to just uh, grab someone's attention. If you have that, you should include on your readme. Uh, if your project is something that you have done in groups or teams, uh, it's a good practice to show who are the contributors on those on those projects and that project. Uh, if there's an issue, send me features requests. You can also include those information on your readme um, license. We already have talked about that, so you don't have to worry on this one. Uh, contract contact information, either maybe just put your LinkedIn or the GitHub also. Uh, LinkedIn or your email just to guide your readers if they are interested in you. They also can contact you in some other way. And if there's also acknowledgements, uh, I wouldn't emphasize on it at the stage that you are right now, but in the future, if you are on this pro pro big project, you are uh, creating a community on, acknowledgement might come handy. There might be a lot of Participate, participant on the project, such party libraries that you have collaborated with, sponsored with, so you acknowledgement is also something that would be expected to be on the ready. If you are on the stage badges, if you have one, you can include them. Uh, project status, if it's an ongoing start, uh, project or it's in the development or it's abandoned, uh, giving this kind of some hints, the project status will also is something that is going to be put on the readme file. So this is about the readme. So you can, uh, the most thing that should be uh, someone expect from this readme are this kind of informations will be included on the readme. Now, uh, hope I'm not talking first, let's move to the tools. What kind of tools, they work tools 
are included on a best repository, GitHub repository, uh, in, car in current status that we are in. Docker is um, one of the most common tools where we use it for the DevOps part. Uh, it helps us to do automation. Uh, in, it makes a consistent, reliable way to build, deploy, run your application across different environments, which is really a very cool tool. So Docker implementation, Docker Compose uh, implementation is also a tool which allows you to define and manage multi-container Docker applications. In one file, you can connect all those multi-Docker containers and run them uh, with simple commands, depending on how you configure it on your file. So this, the Docker, Docker Compose, the make file also, also another tool that help to build and manage your projects much better. Uh, and there is the YAML. This particularly is a language, uh, YAML in Falcon language. It's a tool like JSON and XML files, but this one is more better because it's really human readable. Uh, it's a data serialization uh, format, which helps uh, use for configuration files. It's a kind of language that you write. The way you write with YAML is more readable, clean, and it's the most uh, right now used way of writing your configuration files. So you should use YAML for, for the Docker Compose. You can use the YAML way of writing your Docker Compose uh, in the GitHub, also on the CI/CD implementation on your GitHub workflows. Uh, YAML is also the way you write your configuration on your CI/CD. also could follow the YAML markup language structure, which mostly use identification like Python does. In JSON, use braces if you know. Uh, YAML use identification. It's more clean, human readable, and uh, you can you should use this language also for you guys to be more comfortable with it because it's commonly used right now in Docker Compose, uh, Kubernetes, uh, a lot of tools. For you guys, you probably would use Docker, and with Docker Compose, make sure to use YAML so you you so you know it so you can practice with it. You GitHub CICD also is written on YAML, so uh, you will be more comfortable with it if you implement them. You should implement them actually for uh, for CICD implementation. That's for the DevOps tools. So there are a lot of DevOps tools, but I'm thinking these three. I mean these four. The YAML is for the language, but the makeup file, the Docker, and the Core Compass file, we will expect you to implement them on your uh, repository change that you will do on this week. Uh, types of CI/CD implementation. I mean, there are a lot of types for CI/CD implementations. Uh, the, I put all the types here. I mean, some of the types, but you should focus on this one on the GitHub Action. This is uh, the is accessible for you. It's found on your GitHub repository. You use the GitHub Action section or functionality of GitHub to build the CI/CD platform is provided by GitHub. It will allow you to automate software development workflows directly with your GitHub repository from the start to the deployment phase. You can, it helps you to control, automate your application. So with uh, GitHub Action, you can build your CI/CD platform for your application. It, will, it gives you its feedback. If something is wrong in your application, it will try an error, which is easier for you to correct it and make sure your project is going well or performing well. It depends on the configuration you write, of course, on your GitHub action. Uh, but this is the tool on GitHub uh, software platform that allows you to build the CI implementation. Uh, but there are options, other options like GitHub, if you are using on GitLab, that they are similar, mostly. They just are different software companies that have their own way of doing things on managing your repository. So you can also use GitLab, an option. You can use Travis, Circle. They have different platforms which do the same purpose. They give you the same purpose when you come to automating your repository. 
uh, but we recommend you to focus on GitHub Actions for this stage that you are in. So what are so what is what is actually the benefit of CI/CD implementation? The first is consistency. It makes sure your application is built, tested, and deployed consistently across different platform uh, environments, reducing the risk of inconsistency and errors, automation, like like we said, uh, faster feedback. Like I said, it gives you it throws an error that when you make a code change or something on your uh, GitHub repository it is clashing with your configuration on the CICD or GitHub action, for example, it will throw an error which allows you to automatically to just be aware of that error and fix it right away and move on with your work. So it is more faster feedback, improved collaboration in the area of when you are working with a lot of teams in that one particular repository. A lot of change can come from different areas. It will be really hard for one person to control that. But if you have a really good CI CD pipeline, it will throw an error. So it will help you to change each other. Uh, scalability, where you can handle the growing complexity of your application, it will be easily managed with a uh, pipeline like CI CD. So this is about the presentation. What we want you to focus on is all the rich things that I get highlighted here everywhere. The YAML I have highlighted it with great. Make file, Docker file. On all of the slides, I have highlighted at least these things should be included when you rearrange your I'm still on the presentation work, right? Yeah. You are uh, ex expected to include them when you actually structure your repository. Uh, you need to use all the highlighted. We, we need to see on your submission all this applied on your projects. Uh, if you can go further and the name convention, I haven't highlighted anything, but you should use the, the points made, uh, listed here. But as for the tools, we want to see Docker, Docker Compose, my file, so you can practice it. You, you can know it right now before uh, going to actually the working phase. It will help you to go. It help you to be more confident on the DevOps area. So make sure all the highlighted points, to the minimum, at least be put it on your repository. So we, you are expected to pick six. Uh, if I'm not wrong, on the documentation is also mentioned six uh, repositories from the training or uh, you have for so far, and make sure to include them, uh, to include these points on your repository for better structure. And there are repo samples that I put that you can see at a reference. There is a email flow open source code, their source code, the Apache, the Kedro, which you can refer. But we, as a main sample, we want you to focus on Redash and Streamlit because you already have seen these source codes before on the project. So it will be easier for you guys more to understand and just uh, copy what they have done on their structure to yours. So as a main repository for just taking as a sample, uh, the both, uh, especially Redash, most of the highlighted points are included on Redash, so especially the tools. You can refer those to improve your repository. So uh, if you have question, you can go ahead and raise your hand. But this is about what we would expect from you on this uh, repository part. OK, Abu Bakr. Uh, OK, thank you, Ahmed. So, about the commits, since mm -hmm. the, it's already been committed, are we going back changing the commit name? Or oh, I, I don't fully understand that. Uh, it, so, have a good name on the commit still. I think there's an option to name if you are right, but at least for the future, if it's hard for this one. Uh, at least for the future, you make sure your naming is written correctly. But I think there's an option for renaming commit. 
the command with the hash you can grab the commit okay so my my naming convention is a bit different yeah so mm -hmm. how how i name things are so for example i would i would name what i am doing for example if it is uh, initial setting up the environment i would say uh, choir and uh, the actual semicolon and uh, the actual thing i'm doing so if it is a feature thing that i added i would say fits semicolon on and the actual thing i change it so mm, yes. that seems the correct way to do it i mean I, I, from what you're telling me if i see your comic history i can easily understand why you have done what you have changed so it seems descriptive enough the way you did it i'll work out no okay the purpose is to make sure when you commit something just don't commit some uh anything that doesn't have a purpose so if you have done some actually useful thing on the application and you are done with it if user authentication and everything make sure your commit is user authentication so if i read it i will know on this particular new commit that you made you have implemented the user authentication um future it's just for understanding uh, when others see your commit history they should be able to know what you did okay That's so, the purpose. okay so my, my other question is, uh, we, we need to update the contributor uh, MD file, right? You have that, if you have that, yeah, you okay. should. If it's not correctly written, okay. you should. Uh, um, so, okay, and also on the CICD part, mm. uh, some, of, some of the tests uh, are failing. Is it mandatory? Uh, for them to actually pass? Yes. Okay. You should pass. Okay. okay. Henok? Okay. Uh, my question is on like notebooks. You didn't mm. mention notebooks. Like, how is the structure of notebooks supposed Usually, to be? Like? Yeah, I didn't, the naming, you should name it. Uh, for that pur particular purpose for notebook. I mean, if you are using it for, I don't know, the notebook for data cleaning only, just make sure the name is correct for the notebook. Other than that, I wouldn't emphasize anything on it because when it comes to the big picture of deploying your application on everything, you are not actually deploying it through notebook. It's through modules and uh, so I'm focusing on those things. Notebooks is usually for you guys to uh, work on your project and your particular things. So I wouldn't emphasize on it. Do you get what I'm saying? Okay, so like notebook is more for like us, like to visualize stuff. Yeah, it's more like for you, but you the naming, you should make sure the naming is right. Separating your tasks on the notebooks also advisable. So if the data cleaning, just give it one notebook for the data cleaning and naming it right, it will be much easier for other readers what you did. Uh, for you are if you are doing modeling, just make sure the naming is modeling and the modeling part of the notebook should be separated from the data cleaning. This just make it easier for readability. Uh, but professional level. Through modules is the one that you're going to deploy and connect with the front end and everything. So we should focus on those things. Uh, Johannes, is this all expected for from us for tomorrow? Uh, that is the schedule, right? Where is the submission for this one? Let me see the Yeah, it's the submission is tomorrow. Yeah, it's expected from you guys to include this point, the highlighted point to the to the very least. So I hope that answers the question, Hans. Do we have to organize our project? Uh, yes, Jarvis, I am gonna we are I'm gonna emphasize on it. I want you guys to implement the Docker, the MIG file, and use YAML to write your configuration. 
I mean, we could cho choose not to uh, be strict with this, but uh, we are stricting it because we want you to be comfortable with it. They are important to, to learn, so we want you to use this opportunity to take it seriously and actually implement it. It really helps to showcase your skill. Exactly, Abdul Hamid, to showcase your skill. So as much as you can, take this uh, particular presentation seriously and implement all of them uh, to your. Most of them are easy to rearrange. I think the one thing that can give you some hard time would be the DevOps part. But if you give it uh, attention and commitment, I think uh, you can do the, or you can do all those connections. Do we have to get the project functionality working? I mean, yeah, right, Hilary. If they work, I mean, that's a good look for you. So at least they are make sure they are structured, but making them your work work is part of it. So. So is it a matter of time? If time given, do you think you can break this, uh, fix the error, Hilary, with this new change that you're going to make? No, I don't think so, because um, some require like instances, like the fine tunings and so on. So we may not have the resources. Or So uh, what, I was, uh, what I was thinking is, we just have the refinements and maybe in future we will we will just implement the functionality and if not we okay so i think it depends on what you are using on your project i'm not sure but um i guess make sure is that uh do the best you can i guess hilary if your refinement that you, if you are uh, the mentor on your projects can really cause a lot of records, uh, do the best you can to fix the things uh, to some extent. Uh, I guess it depends on your project and the way you wipe in as much. It is six project right, Abdul Hamid. They're supposed to choose six projects and enhance it. That's the information that I have. Is you need to enhance six projects. Yeah. This any of this is for, is not for an academy grading. It really isn't. It's just to showcase your repository and everything to possible employers that you're going to apply in the future. So make sure you remember it's just for you. We want you to be, to look best as much as you can to get uh, interviews and stuff like that. That's in the core right now from now on. So make sure it is for you. Do not for you. Okay. Yeah, there is most of your projects. If, for example, if you take the Gen AI, they have this front end and back end, right? So all, most of your projects are deployable projects. You can deploy the Flask, you can build the React using this DevOps tool. So I would say most of them are maybe the fine tuning part that I would understand, but other than that, most of them are deployable. Okay. Yeah, I, I'm continuing from the above question. If uh, okay. we need to dockerize them, uh, we have to check if the docker is working right. Uh, it's deployable. 
then maybe for some of the projects, I think we need the uh, open AI key. Uh, I think I think we need that. I, I don't think so. I mean, it's not actually the open AI key is when you, I, I don't see that really become relevant to this really. So let's say when you run your application, it's running on local host, right, Javis? Yes. You can see that without the open AI key. Now make sure that deployment happens using these DevOps tools. Just seeing your application through these tools. Forget the open AI key and just deploying it on the internet using these tools. Not on the internet on Unite, but you get what I'm saying, right? They're just the deployment process. It's not we're not actually talking about actually uh, using the key to access some functionality on your code. Only maybe just checking the connections or maybe seeing the front end, just that, that part? Yeah, I, I think you can test that with lookup file after you do the deployment and everything. Those functions are required open IT to work. Uh, just give some some maybe just even if you get some fetch data file from your if you are using database for example without or the open just to see the connection is working and the only thing that left is the open AI key to actually do the functionality. So at least you can get there to that part. Copant. Yeah okay. Okay thank you. There are uh, questions. There are more questions. Okay, if no more questions, uh, we can end the session. Uh, I have shared the slide if you need it on the drive as well. And as always, you can also reach out to us on the Slack to me as well. With that being said, we can eat the session.